Cool. Hey. Um, so you will have to do with my terrible Israeli accent. Um, and we're going to talk about tracking or trying to track a user uh, online to later on replay his actions and create a movie of it. So my name is Danny. Um, you are more than welcome to check out the code at uh, GitHub. It's slash blue hot dog slash Rodan, which is the god of espionage or something in some Greek mythology. Um, just to track along, there is quite a lot of code and uh, it's quite interesting. So the reason I've started playing with uh, the idea of trying to track user interaction online is because current tracking solution, solutions are mainly good at one thing. They are mainly good at giving you like a graph, an aggregation of what the user has been doing uh, on your website. Um, like you can have this chart of total visits. This is a Google Analytics. Uh, you can have a funnel of what the user is doing on your website, uh, like 6.4% came to something and something else. But it's not that interesting. I mean, if you want to really know how the user has been interacting to your website, you have no idea. We're basically clueless when developing a front-end solution or front-end application. We have no idea how the users are actually using your website. We know like the meta information of that. So you might have also encountered like this heat map of uh, mouse movements. So again, it's interesting, but if you want to see like a single user frustration or happiness using your website, it gives you no information. So a friend of mine, while trying to debug some exception um, on our website, and getting frustrated by the stack trace and not knowing if the exception affected any user, what the severity of the exception is, what happened, how the user experienced the exception. I mean, OK, I got the exception, but does it affect his perform, performing the action he was intended to perform on the website? So I started playing with the idea, what if we could actually record the entire user interaction on the website. And what exactly is a user interaction website? What is it composed of? So let's start. Um, the easiest thing and the first thing that we can track easily is user scrolling. Um, it's basically, basically what we're going to do is just when we initialize our script, we're going to track the scroll X scroll Y position and take a time timestamp of the of the current event. By the way, you won't see jQuery code here. It's I have a POC. It's work only on currently on Chrome. It will take some some work to make it work on other browsers, but it should work. So basically, we're going to store the initial scroll X scroll Y position. We're going to take the timestamp of the event and we're going to listen to the scroll scroll event. On each scroll event, we're going to track again the position, the scroll position of X and Y, and the timestamp of the event. So, really easy, nothing interesting here. The next thing is mouse movement. So, mouse movement, again, pretty obvious. Um, the only thing to note here is that we can't ask the browser where the mouse is, so we in our initialize, we can't know where the mouse is located, so we initialize it to zero. It's not that important because the user usually uses the mouse quite a lot and you won't notice it that it's initialized on zero. And we listen to the mouse move event on the document, and for each change we store the position of the mouse which is the page X, page Y position, which is the view relative uh, position of the mouse. Cool, so we have the scrolling and we have the mouse position of the, of the user. So the next thing is the screen size. Again, really easy. 
I'm not even listening for the changes because I don't really, well, it's not yet implemented. We could listen to the resize event of the browser. I don't yet because it's not that many users really re play around with the browser sizes. So basically what we're doing here is track the document uh, client height and take, track the document client width. So again, easy, timestamp, that's it. So even with this basic information, which is fairly easy, we already have a pretty accurate information of what the user, how the user has been using our website. The last thing is, almost the last thing, is the user selection. It's a bit tricky, and it's currently implemented only in the modern browsers, except IE. And there is quite a lot of code here, but it's fairly easy. You can get user selection on a page, which is basically when the user just uses the mouse to select some paragraph or select some information on the page. So we also store, store this. We use the, real, the implementation here is not that important. The basic idea is just to store the meta information of the user selection, and we touch a timestamp, and we listen to selection change event every time that happens. We store, we store the difference of the selection. Cool. So we have user selection. We have the mouse movements. We have uh, screen size. We have the scrolling. So the only thing basically missing from the equation to really see what the user is seeing and to really track the user is the DOM. So if, if you wanted to track the DOM, you have basically two possibilities. Either you could just try to gather all the state of the browser to later on replay that and just run the JavaScript that were run while the user was using the web page and just try to emulate the situation as accurately as possible. But the other way to do it is using a cool new, it's sort of new, uh, API called Mutation Observers. So Mutation Observers were introduced in DOM level four specification, and they came to basically uh, replace mutation events. So anyone here heard of mutation events, used mutation events? Cool, so two, I think, or three, nice. So mutation events, the basic idea of mutation events is to give you a hook to any changes that's being done in the DOM. So you basically get an event each and every time a DOM uh, element is inserted, DOM element gets removed from the node, attribute gets changed, um, data gets changed, like the metadata attribute on the element gets changed. And uh, like basically everything that's going on on the DOM, you can listen to it and you can track it. So that's amazing. So mutation, event, mutation observers are basically that with, uh, and they're coming to solve like few issues that were with mutation events. So mutation observers have, has amazing browser support. You can basically use it throughout all the browsers uh, except IE10, it's coming in IE11, but I'm, I, I don't think anybody can, can really count on the IE for anything today, so. And uh, the one thing to note about mutation observers, as opposed to basically everything you were doing on the DOM, is that they implement a quite different approach for events. They're basically not events, they're observer. So what basically happens once you listen for uh, once you register your mutation observer is that it doesn't get called each and every time a mutation happens. It, it will get called once the browser finished executing the current code. So they are asynchronous in the most basic level because it's not like the browser sees a DOM mutation happens and just stops, it, stops everything and calls your code. It waits and it's in, it will call your code once it's finished doing the current uh, task it's doing. So basically the way that this works is that the browser aggregates the information and stores it, stores it and later on calls your callback with an aggregation of information that happens between the last time it called your callback. So it's fast and it doesn't, uh, 
it incurs almost no performance penalty on the, on the browser, which is amazing if you want to do a tracking of the user. And for such thing that like DOM mutation, it's really important. Cool, so what exactly can we get from uh, mutation observers, or what can we exactly listen for? So we can listen to child or root observation, so we can basically tell the browser, give me an event or give me a notification each and every time my, my children or my subchildren or the entire tree of the DOM get changed, get any change. We can listen to attribute modification. We can listen to content changes like text element get changed. And we can listen to get uh, the data attribute changes. So basically, everything you can see in the DOM to be changed, you will get notification of that. So cool. So let's see how exactly does it look. So on Chrome, it's unprefixed. So it basically sits under the window. You can use Mutation Observer fairly easily. Um, the one thing to note here is that we register our callback function once we create the object. So once we initialize the Mutation Observer object, we give it a callback function. And the callback function basically receives uh, mutations, which is an array of mutation records. And once we want to listen, we call the observe um, method and give it an element we want to listen to. It's all coffee script, but I think you guys will get it. So you have a few options you can give it. You can say if you want to listen to child uh, elements, so just the first level, children of the element, you want to listen to modifications. You can say if you want to listen to attribute changes. You can say if you listen to character data, which is the data attribute of the element. You can also say you, I want to listen to every subtree modification, so that like the entire tree of the element. Uh, you can also say you want to get the old value before the change. You can also get the old data value before the change. And you can also filter the attributes you want to listen to. So a lot of options, quite amazing. So what exactly does a single mutation record look like? So you get the added nodes. So that's a list of added nodes being added on, in this operation. You get the attribute name, if applicable. You get the next sibling, and you get the previous sibling. So the next sibling and the previous sibling, we're going to use it later on to really pinpoint the location of the operation. So you really can know exactly where the added nodes were added. You can really pinpoint where the removed nodes were removed. You also get the target, which is the parent of the operation. And you get the child, which can be either a child list or, uh, or attribute uh, data, I think. Cool, so a single mutation record basically gives us added remove nodes. We have the type of the change, attribute, character, data, et cetera. We get the target of the operation. We get the previous next sibling nodes. And we get the value before the change. So, and we have the value and we have with the name of the changed attribute. So basically, all the information needed to try and serialize the change to the server side. And like with everything with the DOM or browsers and the web, there are few limitations because the web moves quite fast in few different directions. So it can't listen to CSS. So if you have like a meta attribute like after on CSS and stuff like that, it won't get notification on changes on that. You can't listen to like mouse hover. You, can, you won't get notification of that. Um, the good thing is it's coming there, and it probably will be there one day. Uh, there are already a specification being set, and a few browsers are talking about how to implement that. So CSS notifications will be there someday. And uh, as was being talked in the previous talk, we don't have Shadow DOM yet, and we don't have any notification on Shadow DOM. So if you have like the HTML5 uh, video element, which is basically a Shadow DOM component, you won't get notification on any changes in that component. 
So basically, anything you don't see in the inspector, you won't see, you won't get notification on the, those, those changes. And the one biggest limitation if you want to track a user online is that because it's aggregated, you don't get a timestamp of the operation. So basically, the, browsers give, the browser gives you the information, but it doesn't say exactly when it happened. The good thing is it's happened quite a lot, and DOM changes happen really often on the, on the DOM, and it probably will happen in close proximity to where it, when it really happened. Cool, so we can track, yeah, I love, I love shi shiny colors, so. We can, track, uh, we can track the user modification of the DOM, but how exactly do we serialize a node? So before coming to this problem and trying to really serialize and trying to track a user online, I was really, I, I, was, I was thinking that it would be really easy to track or serialize a node. So, but when trying to do this, it became a real challenge. So what exactly is a DOM node? I think everybody here once in a while just typed, just selected the node and in Chrome Inspector just console logged it or console did it. And if you did, you probably seen like tons of methods, tons of attributes, tons of meta information in the prototype, etc. So what exactly is a node and how do we serialize that to later on replay it on the server? So Node is basically composed of a style, so you need to know how to, the browser needs to know how to display it. There, there are attributes for the node, there are text content for the node, and there is a child node, so it's basically a recursive operation. So that's about it if you want to serialize a node. If you have all this information, the browser, you can later on recreate the node in the correct position, and that's easy. So, the next problem is if we want to store a node, is how, we do, how do we identify a node? So we have a node, we serialize the node, we serialize the metadata of the node. How exactly do we know on which node are we talking about? So there are basically two solutions here. We can either just, I don't know, just save the X path or some path of the node for each and every node, but it will become quite expensive since it will need to happen every each and every node. Or the solution I've chosen is simply just in the initial initialization of the script, just map the entire document and give each node a unique identification like an ID and later on reuse that ID to serialize the node. So the whole process of serializing or tracking a user online is basically might look something like this. So we map the document nodes, give each a unique ID. We store initial view size, scroll position, mouse location. We store the initial DOM tree before the modifications, and we store the user selection. We start listening for the various changes. So I have like a bunch of observers. I have the mouse movement observer. I have the view size, if uh, applicable, observer. I have the user selection observer and stuff like that. So I listen to various events for any changes and I record those changes. So replaying is basically, I will try to show some code later on, but it's really messy code because trying to interact with the DOM in such a low level, like recreating the DOM elements and saving them, it's really an awful idea, but uh, it works, so. Replaying is basically doing the same, same thing the other way around. You can use the iframe for viewport size. You can use uh, for each event, I simply replay it. So, so scrolling is easy. Uh, I use a fixed position div for the mouse movement. And I add remove change node for each mutation record. So let's see a quick demo. The one thing to note here is that we don't really use the JavaScript on the page. We only use the effects of the browser, the JavaScript did on the page. So we, when we're playing the user interaction, we don't really even render the JavaScript the user was using on the page. We only, we only see this, okay, so this node was added, we add the node. This node was removed, we remove the node. So in no point, we, actual user interaction is happening. We only store the meta information. So 
Without further ado, let's take a look at the, some demo. So I will show you a demo using on Sales.js, which is a Node.js framework. I hit the record button and I simply use the page. There are a few, you can see the console log showing some console logs of uh, the events. I scroll, I use the application, I do some selection. So as you can see, there is no integration on the web page itself. It's basically outside the web page altogether. So I'm using the page, scrolling, moving the mouse, blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's it. So let's try and do a re replay of that. So I will show local replay. So I go to, it's my web server. As you can see, my mouse is up there. So what you're basically seeing is a full replay of a user interaction on the web page. So that's not me browsing, even though it's a movie, but even in the movie, it's not me. Cool, so that was the demo. If there are a few limitations to this uh, technique, and the main limitations are that Assets are hard to serialize. There are ways to overcome this. I haven't really touched that yet, but uh, you might use a proxy to store the assets or something, or I don't know, or, or just run the, run the replay on a, an, an actual server. But assets are hard. CS, external CSS, also hard. You don't have access for, to serialize the external CSS because the cross-domain security policy also applies to external CSS. I didn't know that when I started. It was really, really disappointing to know that. And that's it. So thanks, questions, and you're more than welcome to check out the code. Thank you.